very much. It's very nice to be people with people my own age. <laughs> uh, I want to thank Marjorie for uh, arranging for this and the friends of the Winchester Library for being, uh, uh, being here. We're 49 years we spent living in Winchester, so this library meant a great deal to us and we spent a lot of time here and it's always been a special place for all the Gittlemans. Winchester is the right store kind of town to talk about American higher education. About 75% of the population has a bachelor or advanced degree. Uh, just under 50% have an advanced degree, and the total number is three out of every four people have either an undergraduate degree or an advanced degree. So it's an extremely educated community. In fact, Middlesex County is one of those rarities. It's got uh, uh, Lexington, Newton, Acton, and uh, Concord. Uh, they did a survey of 6,000 towns in the United States, and no county had as many highly educated people as Middlesex County. We were up there with Cupertino count Valley out in California, but this was quite a remarkable um, uh, survey that was taken that showed these are highly educated communities. I had to correlate that, and I've been trying to correlate it over the last couple of years with another survey that was taken over the last two decades, they've been taking it every year, the percentage of Americans who believe that higher education is leading to the decline of American life. <laughs> that is another survey, and those numbers are getting larger and larger. The last survey said 62% of Americans believe that higher education is one of the significant problems in America. So it, it's an interesting time to be a, even a retired academic um, it's understandable if you read enough newspapers and watch enough television because you're guaranteed to get at least one story daily about the failure of American colleges and universities in some respect. Even we made it into the Middle East. I mean, the current newspapers every day talk about a failure of a yet another school that is unable to communicate the nuance, the subtleties, the s whatever is going on in the Middle East. The universities are at fault. We make the front page because the Middle East is blowing up and the university is in fault. Uh, you, we simply can't escape it. So it, you understood it even before the current horrors that are going on in the Middle East. Uh, the, the language was, the newspapers were filled really with denunciations in the newspaper of what Americans' problems were with universities. The student debt is $1.7 trillion. The fact that over half of that is for for-profit institutions and the, the, the universities are at fault for charging too much money, and they do, because it's a capitalist nation and it's supply and demand. If you've got people applying, you're going to try to get as much money as you can, and they did. And higher education charged and kept charging, and people kept applying and kept coming, and they continue to come. Now, prestige, the hunt for prestige, the university rankings, uh, the predatory faculty, sexual misconduct, abuse, the obsessive uh, headhunting for donors, the need to build up your endowment. The worst, I think, of recent time, for my own particular prejudice, is Division I athletics and the amount of money that is spent in connection with gambling in the United States and universities. We're spending about $4 billion a year on college gambling, and now the colleges are moving around the country, the NCAA has up, opened something called the transfer portal, and a student which, who used to not be able to play in the year that he transferred now can transfer once, twice, three times, and go from school to school to school and selling his talents as much as possible. These stories in the newspaper are awful. You hear also about poor teaching, research fraud, dishonesty, uh, political correctness. Nothing we do seems to be right. And as a result, the American people have lost, the majority of them have lost faith in the American uh, higher education institution. It's not recent. This has been going on for over 40 years. It's just reached its culmination now. It actually started in 1987 with an, an, an academic from the University of Chicago. You probably all remember him because you're old enough to remember him. Alan Bloom, who wrote a book uh, that was called uh, The Closing of the American Mind, how higher education has failed democracy. That's a, a, a page turner, and that's a title that will get your attention. How higher education has failed democracy. Bloom is a professor of philosophy, University of Chicago, and he said, we have failed 
Uh, he sold a million copies of that book. The Americans devoured it. We were ready already at that time to think about American education as a failure uh, in their time. And I began asking myself because uh, we were doing some very extraordinary things. We, I thought we were teaching better than we ever taught before. Our s researchers were digging into archival material in a way that we never dreamt before. I mean, I learned my Civil War history from Gone with the Wind. <laughs> we didn't teach civil, nobody taught me anything about the Civil War in, Amer in my elementary school back in the 30s and early 40s. Uh, what did I know about Custer's Last Stand? It's what Errol Flynn taught me about Carol's, uh, I mean, 80 million Americans went every week to the movie when I was a kid growing up. So uh, that's where we learned our history. We never really got to it. And yet we looked upon those days as somehow halcyon days of great accomplishment and a, a, a sort of a remarkable uh, golden age. Um, and I asked myself, really? Is this, is this what Alan Bloom wants? A kind of golden age? Fortunately, my lifespan covered all of that period, and I can remember with some clear memory of what life was like in the 30s and very early 40s, even after we got into the war, from, the, not, from our, our not being in the war to getting into the war after 1941. And here we are again right now, and there are a million 250,000 international students once again on our campuses. Uh, that stopped during COVID, naturally enough, but they're back. The COVID is cured, and we have a f foreign students begging to get in. If we had decent uh, immigration laws, we'd have two million foreign students on our campus. They can't all go to the select elite prestigious school. There are a thousand of them at UMass Amherst. There are 200 of them at UMass Bridgewater, uh, Bridgewater State. They're at Westfield State. They're at every college in America that will take them because they want something about the United States that we have. The only thing the rest of the world seems to want are our weapons, our universities, our sweatshirts, and um, uh, our um, entertainment. We have a $36 billion surplus. We make money on higher education in America, and yet the American people are not prepared to accept that. They don't want to hear it. It's a trade surplus they don't want to know about, and they prefer thinking that we are a failure. Uh, their message is, what they hear is, once we had great colleges, and that golden age is over, we don't have them anymore. Once we taught great civics, once we taught great history, once we taught everything right, and now we don't do it, the faculty is at fault because they're teaching inappropriately and unfairly. I've gotten to learn to live with evidence. You have to look at the evidence. So in writing this book, I was fortunate to have both age and memory still uh, as an advantage. This is not just a tale of Winchester, it's a tale of two cities, the one that I was born in also. I was born in Hoboken, New Jersey, a very gritty longshoreman's town that was almost completely immigrant, that had very little interest in higher education. It had a, 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 a very, very tough community of people. Nobody talked about college. Nobody was interested in college. In fact, nobody was interested in college in the 1930s at all. Nobody went to college. Who went to college? Uh, and again, I go back to where I learned all about college. I learned all about college in the movies. My grandmother, who was a European immigrant who in 40 years in this country, never learned to put one sentence of English together because my parents were European immigrants. They came over as teenagers. They never learned to school in this country. Education, and for the vast majority of people in Hoboken, education meant very, very little. Prestige meant what kind of a car you drove if you had a Buick instead of a Plymouth, if you had a Ford or if you had an Oldsmobile, that was prestige. Colleges meant nothing and nobody went to college. It was simply the way life was at that time. Uh, whenever possible, Hollywood had its finger on the pulse and they knew it. A movie we saw over and over, most of the movies that came to Hoboken were reruns. And so we saw my mother, grandmother, who took me three times a week to the movies, she loved the Marx Brothers. The Marx Brothers to her were the ultimate. And so whenever the Marx Brothers movie came, we saw it. There was one that was made in 1932 that probably played 10 times in Hoboken before 1940. It was a movie with, obviously with all the brothers, but again, it was uh, Groucho Marx in a movie called Horse Feathers. He played President Quincy Adams Wagstaff of Huxley College. He, the entire movie he spends in his mortarboard, in his uniform and his hat. 
And his job as president of Huxley was to beat Darwin College in the big game. Now, in those days, you could hire two professional ball players. It was legal to hire two professional ball players for your college team. And he, of course, went out and hired Chico and Harpo. And they became the backfield. Zeppo was busy. He was busy with a woman who was called the campus widow. And she spent most of her time in the men's dormitory. Uh, I, I was about seven years, eight years old when I first saw that movie. I couldn't wait to go to college. <laughs> college looked just terrific. Then a few years later, I went and we saw, my grandmother took me to see a movie called Newt Rockney, All-American. Newt Rockney, played by Pat O'Brien. Ronald Reagan played the Gipper, the football Notre Dame. I came home and told my mother, I'm going to Notre Dame, I'm becoming a Catholic. <laughs> I mean, the motion pictures had this enormous impact on us, and we simply accepted all of that. If you paid attention, you noticed that the whole faculty was white, they were all silly, nobody took them seriously, they were, uh, the student body was all white, every once in a while we'd catch a movie with Mickey Rooney, or uh, uh, Judy Garland going to college, and they were all white. There were a few girls, mostly men. The faculty was homogeneous. The faculty was all men, all white. They sounded very Protestant, and they were, that's what, and that was an accurate depiction of what the faculty was like. The American faculty was harmonious, unified, and homogeneous. They all thought the same way because they were the only people who went to college and the only people who continued on to become teachers at American institution. I, began, I asked myself recently, I said, was that the golden age that Alan Bloom was talking about? Had a hard time to accept that, but few people in the 1930s care. If you go back and examine American history in the 1930s, it was a remarkable period. FDR had been elected president, but the most popular American at that time was Charles Lindbergh. If anybody had, if Lindbergh had run against FDR, he was the only person who had an opportunity, might have been able to beat FDR for the presidency. And Americans revealed already who, what kind of genius they liked. They liked the genius of Edison, they liked the Wright brothers, they liked Henry Ford. These were the American geniuses. And what do they have in common? What do they have in common? Include Vanderbilt and Rockefeller, if you want to throw them in. None of them went to college. They were all uneducated. They had what Americans love. They love street smart. There is a strong anti-intellectual streak that runs through American, um, through American life. Adley Stevenson could have run for presidency 50 times. He never would have gotten elected. He had an egghead. He looked like an egghead. He looked like an intellectual. Americans don't like intellectuals. That's simply who we are. And that's where we were. So I asked myself then, as I'm thinking about this book, how did we arrive at where we are today, where Americans win the majority of the Nobel Prizes, every person who won a Nobel Prize, whether American or not, had an American fingerprint on that medal because they studied in an American university. There is one unimpeachable source of excellence in higher education, and ironically, it's a, a survey taken by the University of Shanghai you can find it online if you look at the Shanghai rankings of, Amer of research universities worldwide. Uh, that's only research. All they care about is research, medals, Nobel Prizes, uh, articles published in the very best, high, most reputed journals. And in the current list, the 2023 list, of the top 24, 17 are American. We've had that percentage for the last 50 or 60 years. The American Research University is the envy of the world. There are no colleges anywhere else. Uh, they, they simply don't exist. So I, I started asking myself, you know, where, what is the gold age? How, we've got 5,000 colleges in this country. They range from small to large, to, uh, tiny, enormous, for-profit, not-for-profit, rural <coughs> country, faith-based. Most of them are faith-based institutions. Most of, most of them started as faith-based institutions. The little Methodist college I went to was a started. So I tried to find out why do Americans believe, what is there in American uh, higher education history that lends Americans to think that our higher education system had a golden age that we've lost and now we're mired in some terrible period where higher education is failing us. Well, I felt the only way to do it was to take another look at the beginning and see what the start looked like. It was not a promising start. 17th century Puritan America 
was probably the most intolerant period of American history. Uh, it, was a, it was a theocracy, and the colleges that founded at that time, Harvard in 1636, and a few others after, uh, after that, also were theocracies. They came here from England and the Netherlands looking for religion and religious freedom, and the first thing they did was deny religious freedom to everyone else. And these were all Protestants. Very few Catholics came. All Protestants, and they hated each other. Uh, Harvard was for the Congregationalists. The Calvinists couldn't stand it. They left to go to and find a new haven. That new haven became yeah. Yale. Uh, by that time, they were burning um, um, Quakers on the Boston Common. I mean, we have monuments to Mary Dyer on the Boston Common. They, they actually hang Quakers. They hang Quakers on the Boston Common. They drowned Baptists on the banks of the Charles River. So the Baptists had a flee also. And they went to find a new providence. And they found it with a benefactor named Brown and founded Brown, Brown University. So all of them, the Episcopalians, had William and Mary in Virginia. The evangelical Presbyterians thought that Christ was going to come to New Jersey. So they went down and founded Princeton. They were all tiny evangelical colleges, all waiting for the Messiah to come. They were all totally faith-based. And this was their great hope, that they would wait. And they only taught one subject. Their only job was to train ministers. That was their sole exclusive job, Latin, Greek, Hebrew and the Bible. Those were the subjects that were taught. Occasionally somebody slipped in a little uh, mathematics. In 1705, there were 1,800 ministers in the colonies. By 1805, there were 40,000. So we were training ministers as almost the exclusive, right, the exclusive position, the exclusive uh, job that you could have in the United States. You became a, you became a minister. 1803 caused a great deal of excitement in this country. We were now a republic, and what happened in 1803 that changed the calculus on higher education? We were a small number of tiny schools preparing ministers along the Atlantic seaboard. What happened in 1803? Thomas Jefferson negotiates with the French government and Bonaparte the Louisiana Purchase and the United States more than doubles its size. And in a heartbeat, Christ crossed the Appalachian. He crossed the mountains and went into the unknown territories. The only people who didn't know about the Louisiana territories were the people who lived there and owned the land, the Native Americans. They were gonna get it one way or the other. They were not gonna come out of this particularly uh, uh, hole, but this is what happened. God's will was cross the Appalachians, and in that period, from 1805 for the next 50 years, first hundreds, then thousands of small church-based colleges were created. Uh, every one of the major denominational uh, uh, groups founded them, the Methodists, there were Wesleyans everywhere. You had Episcopalians, you had Baptist churches, uh, little churches, all of them faith-based. Some of them disappeared before they even were founded. Why? You had cholera, you had epidemics, you had fire, you had flood, and then also you were attacked by the natives who were there, said, what are these people all doing here? Get rid of them. So the church, the little school stayed, little disappeared, but many of them, many of them stayed. You know their names. I mean, whether it's Allegheny, your Sinus, Moravian, uh, 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 any number of Thousands of little colleges that you've all heard about all through your life. Grinnell, the Catholics came also, they got Notre Dame, Aquinas, um, uh, hundreds of them everywhere all throughout the United States. The curriculum was the same, Latin, Greek, Hebrew, the Bible. And the West or the Midwest or the Louisiana Purchase needed a little bit more than that because the farmers and the small merchants and the little village owners and the store owners needed some help. And they appealed to their legislators, asked the legislators, can you give us a little bit of assistance, some help in all of this? We need assistance for farming, we need assistance in our business, we need assistance in our mining. And they finally got to a senator from of all places, Vermont, he wasn't in that Midwestern gang, 
He was in Vermont. They thought he would have the best chance of getting legislation passed. And the legislation named after Justin Morrill, Senator of Vermont, was the Morrill Land Grant Act of 1859, which, by the way, was vetoed by President Buchanan, did not become law. But it said, we will give each state or territory 30,000 acres of prime farm and forest land that you can then sell or harvest and set up an educational institution that will help you with agriculture, what they called metallics, mining, and manufacture. A and M. The beginning of those schools, and it was based on a grant of land. So they were called land-grant institutions. It was vetoed by Buchanan, but then after the Civil War, and, um, Abraham Lincoln signed it into law in 1862, and the Land-Grant Act was established. The great A&M state universities of the Midwest Territory, some of them finally came into the East, surprisingly, when you discover which is a land grant. University of Massachusetts is the Massachusetts land grant. But the Texas A&M, uh, Michigan State, the great state universities, Kansas State, uh, all of those and their branches uh, became agricultural research stations to help the farmers. And then to help the manufacturers, they became little nascent engineering colleges to help practical use. So this was practical vocational education. And that's what the American farmer, the American store owner, the American inventor needed. Some practical help from the university. They don't need Latin, they didn't need Greek, they didn't need Bible. That was there if you wanted it. The South wouldn't participate before the Civil War because they said, we're not going to give this to any, we're not going to have any women, we're not going to have any blacks. The North said, we don't want any blacks and we don't want any women either. Every, I mean, racism and that kind of attitude permeated the United States. It just wasn't the South. The South was ready to go to war over it, but this is the way the nature of it was. That was not enough to establish a golden age. It was a nice step forward for American vocational institutions. And we did take a step forward for about 50 years that helped America get to a place, it helped the small farmers, it helped manufacturers, it helped the growing of corn, it helped the growing of wheat, it gave aid and comfort to all those small time people in the Midwest and far west, Whitman College in Washington. They're all there, these land grant institutions. They had one other thing that they had, were mandatory. You had to have A and M, and you also must have the country defended because the Indians were attacking constantly and so all of these land grant institutions must have military training, what we today call ROTC. Now, some schools that you never thought of, perhaps, although we may have some alumni here, uh, are land grants. Cornell is a land grant institution, partially. MIT is a land grant institution. So MIT must have ROTC. If ROTC goes at MIT, MIT closes its doors. So there was no debate. The faculty could have been the left of, of Karl Marx. It didn't make any difference. They knew that ROTC had to stay there. In fact, when ROTC left Tufts and Wellesley and BU and Harvard, they all went to MIT. And art students are still trained at MIT because MIT is the only institution that by law and absolute law must continue having uh, ROTC. So their nation must be defended, was very much a part of the Land Grant Act. So there was still no golden age out there. Aggie schools, engine practical, beginning engineering and vocational, that was no golden age. Then came the Civil War. And the Civil War, besides producing horror and mass death, produced enormous fortunes. This was America, the Gilded Age at its very best. Huge amounts of money were made by a small number of people. Great fortunes, and it led to another step forward. We'll find out if you think it's a golden age. Uh, an attempt to create a golden age with wealth. Now, what was the money made with? Cotton, tobacco, transportation, oil, railroads, canals, new names associated with this, and associated with higher education of all things. Hopkins. Rockefeller, Vanderbilt, Stanford, Cornell, Duke, Carnegie, Mellon, all of them said, we have a common agenda. 
We want to create universities that are going to help us make more money. And we have a model that we could look to. Something was happening across the Atlantic in the 1860s and 1870s. And it was happening in a newly created country. It had been Prussia, and then Prussia brought them all together under one very, very smart um, nobleman, Otto von Bismarck, and the German <coughs> higher education system combined business, science, the military, the university, to create a new environment. And above all, you had to have the schooling before that contributing to it. You couldn't waste time with young kids. Get them out of the way, make those decisions, get the cream of the cream, get them into our universities, and have them do one thing and one thing only, research. What the Germans called hohe Wissenschaft, high, high investigation. Not just science, but it was predominantly science. And that's what the American uh, philanthropists, the American new millionaires saw. They saw a Europe that really contributed to the making of a great business environment of invention, creation, and a, a way that the country could flourish. Indeed, Johns Hopkins and the Germans had created a new degree for this. They also decided, we'll get this all straightened out. They created an, a, a, a system for early education so that at the age of 11 or 12, decisions were made. You're going to be a doctor. You're going to clean toilets. They, could, they made an assessment at a very early age who was going to go on to one streak that was going to la la land you at a university. And when you arrived at that university, what were you ready for? Research. You were already an advanced student capable of doing extraordinary amounts of research and serve for the pleasure of the senior faculty member who was also a researcher. So research was the agenda, advancement was the agenda, and the Germans had made a model that was working for them. And they were really tremendous. They found the best and the brightest, created a pathway for them to discovery. The new degree that used to be if you were a magister, if you were a master, what could be better than being a master? Well, they created another degree, the PhD, the Doctor of Philosophy. They called it philosophy, but it was a degree that taught you how to do research, how to start research and how to continue it and to become independent as a researcher. Almost from the beginning, from the 1860s, 1870s, even before it was the Second Reich, the Second Empire, it was just Prussia, the Germans swept the field of invention, creative, and disease control. Names like Bunsen, well, we have the Bunsen burner, Bayer, by bear aspirin, Bering, Koch, uh, Ehrlich, Röntgen. They conquered diseases, they found cures, they found vaccines, they found bacterial disease vaccines, they, they, and the German people honored them in a way that you very rarely see. They honored their scientists, they honored the people who made these great discoveries. Again, they were famous. It was the gratitude of the nation and the American Philanthropists said, that's what we want. We want, to be, we want a nation to be grateful to us. And so what Hopkins and Chicago were when they were created, 1869, 1875, they were created as graduate schools exclusively. No undergraduates. But this is a different kind of capitalist country than Germany was. Germany was still, even with Bismarck and all of this great research, an authoritarian country, everything was from top down. You were still a civil servant working for the state. The government controlled everything. In this country, there was always a kind of anarchy that went on in just about everything as they tried to determine, is the state in charge, is the federal government in charge, or is nobody in charge? For the most part, it was nobody was in charge. As these universities kept going and kept growing. But this is what the richest Americans wanted. No undergraduates at Hopkins in Chicago, but the business model didn't work. As rich as Hopkins and John, uh, Johns Hopkins and um, John B. Rockefeller were, they didn't have enough money to constantly pour in, and they didn't. They were all so frugal. They didn't want to do it. So eventually, they had to get undergraduates, but the K through 12 system in this country was mediocre. K through 12, we already still had at that time probably 150,000 one-room schoolhouses. 
America in K through 12, we had Massachusetts, very lucky. We had New York, had Horace Mann, we had Horace Mann, we have the great couple of schools that were wonderful, but for the most part, American K through 12 was dreadful. Uneven from state to state, from city to city. We had at one time 150,000 school boards. You couldn't get Medford and Walden to agree on the same book. Everybody wanted to go in their own direction, and they did. And so that was where America was. We were not ready to have a golden age. We had too much mediocrity in our K through 12. And besides these new free institutions uh, uh, that were not state run, these Hopkins, Chicago, Vanderbilt, Stanford, uh, we, uh, these were all private institutions now created from philanthropic wealth, Duke, tobacco money, um, they needed a, a, a different number of schools. They tried to emulate the Germans and they couldn't. But from the 1860s to the 70s to the 80s to the 90s into the 21st, 20th century, Germany dominated science and learning all over the world. There was nothing like them. So when the Nobel Prize was started in 1901, it was a wholly owned German subsidiary. The Germans were winning 60% of all the Nobels, the rest of the people were working in Germany. In America, if you wanted a decent education beyond your college, you went to Germany. It was Germany where everybody went to and where Germany had the great university system that everybody uh, really were desperate to emulate and to create. The United States was going through an, another interesting period in the second half of the, of the 19th century. The, we, the, the North won the Civil War, the South won the peace. By 1876, Reconstruction was dead. And we went right back. We didn't learn this in school, particularly, but Reconstruction was over, and the blacks were put, reduced to a state of subservience. It wasn't only blacks. The Chinese were brought in to build the Great Western Railroads. When they were building it, they would get blown up or somehow died by the massive numbers. And when we were done, we created the Jap Chinese Exclusionary Act and said, no more Chinese immigrants and no more Japanese immigrants. If you were yellow, black, red, or brown, you were in trouble. This was a white man's country and indeed white men. Those are the people who owned it. You could look at the constitutions, the original constitutions of states like Illinois, um, Indiana, California, Oregon, and it said only white men can sit on juries. No Chinaman, and that's the phrase they use, no Chinaman can testify against a white man. That was found routinely in American constitutions, in state constitutions. So we were a country preoccupied with race all through the 19th century. We had other people that, were, that wanted to be white, like the Irish, who came over in massive numbers of immigrants uh, in the 1840s and 1850s, then the 1880s. And what were they as far as the, the great structure of American capitalism was? What do these people represent? The Irish in the 1840s, 1850s, the, um, uh, the uh, Italians and Jews from Russia and from Italy in the 1880s, 1890s. This was what? For, for, for American business. That's why the Wall Street Journal advocates, advocates open immigration. Cheap labor. They want cheap labor and that's the way to get cheap labor. Let them in and find work for them somewhere along the line. The ones that don't get it, that's tough on them. So American, but by 1890, and we had done that, we had let people come in. By 1892, the Anti-Immigration League was established at Harvard. Uh, the vice president was gonna be the next president of the uni university, Abbott Lowell. And anti-immigration, based on what Americans considered biology, won the day. Now what, what kind of biology were we teaching in America in the elementary schools, secondary schools, colleges? U uniformly, one kind of biology. It had been, it emerged out of Darwin, but it was his nephew, uh, uh, James Galton, who really took it to the next step. He created a word about racial categories called eugenics. And eugenics became the main topic and direction of American biology from the 1870s on for the next 50 and 60 years. <clears throat> if you want to find what an American undergraduate looked like, read The Great Gatsby, uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald's novel, and you find the character of Tom Buchanan, 
in the very earliest pages. Tom Buchanan, Yale, 1915. Great football player, great everything. Uh, came, walks into, a, into the, a, a room and says, well, I just finished another great book called The End of the White Race. He says the white race is disappearing, the colored races, the colored people are taking over this country. If we don't do something about it, he says, I learned all about this in college and I'm learning. That was the American undergraduate biology course that was taught in the United States in almost every university at MIT, at Harvard. Uh, we might not have been advanced enough at Tufts to teach eugenics because we didn't. But at the, at the most advanced institutions in the Midwest, Michigan, Wisconsin, every place that considered itself a serious research university, eugenics was the way it was going to be taught. And the laws of the land reflected that. Uh, that's simply the way that we wanted to have it uh, in this country. By 1896, the, the, the Congress passed Plessy versus Ferguson that separated the races permanently. Separate but equal. Well, it was separate, it never was equal. But the South got what it wanted, the war was lost, but the peace was won, and eugenics was triumphant. Teddy Roosevelt, Woodrow Wilson, routinely talked about racial suicide. What they meant by racial suicide was whites and blacks marrying. They thought you will destroy the gene pool, you don't do that, whites and blacks should never marry. The most popular movie that Wilson showed in the White House was uh, uh, The Klansman, was, uh, what was the name of that movie? Uh, Birth, of the Birth of a Nation. That was the first movie shown in the White House by Woodrow Wilson. Wilson was Princeton president, governor, and president of the United States, but he was uh, a, a, a white supremacist. Uh, so was Teddy Roosevelt. They were wonderful people. They did all the right kinds of things with the uh, national parks, but T.R. believed that blacks were inferior. He believed also that Irish were inferior, and that Italians were inferior, and Jews were inferior. And that was an, that the only thing that really counted was good Anglo-Saxon stock. And that would make America great. The 14, the, there were only 14 universities at the end of the 19th century that said, we are doing research as good as the Germans. And they banded together and created an organization called the American um, uh, AAU, the American Association of Universities. They were, and they said, we are the great 14 research universities in the country, and we are as good as the Europeans. It was the year they founded, it was 1901, and it was Harvard, Princeton, Yale, who now were determined to become as good as the Germans. Michigan, University of California, University of Chicago, Catholic University in America, and what we would say, consider today an anomaly, Clark University. Clark University was the only school that ever gave Sigmund Freud an honorary degree in this country. Uh, they thought he was too dirty, too sexy. But Clark was initially a research university, and then it lost its, it, it lost its footing. But the Germans got a good laugh at it about that because it was not anything that was really uh, 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 serious in terms of creating the kind of research that the Germans were doing. And that's the way it stayed in America. We could be second best in certain fields. In physics, in the 1920s and 19, early 1930s, we were pretty good. Everybody who was a, a decent American researcher in physics had a German PhD, except uh, uh, Lawrence from California. He got his PhD in Minnesota, but as soon as he did, he fled over to Germany and studied two years at Göttingen. The German universities were leading in everything, but particularly in physics, biology, and all the fields associated with the Nobel Prize. It was a closed club. It was white, male, sort of village born, born in the small towns of the American uh, East, Midwest, and Far West. It was small town culture and small town celebration of American life. The manifest destiny, that aspect of history was how it was taught. We, manifest destiny meant that America was an example of what? God's will. This country was put here by God to make it what it was and to bring, and if, if you ever think that this is not a Christian country, you've got to take another look at it. It's still a Christian country. If, depending on who's going to get elected, you'll see that the evangelical Christian vote will be very, very significant. Everybody's trying to get it, so they're all fighting for it. May not be too big here in Winchester, but out in the Midwest and Far West, it is a major factor, and that is what really stimulates 
of the voting in this country. In the 1920s and 1930s, it was dominant. The KKK had a resurgence. The Ku Klux Klan, with their white hoods, hated Catholics and they hated Jews. And they could march with impunity through the streets of Washington and New York, holding rallies everywhere because there was nobody to stand up to them. This country was what it was, and, in 19, and it was anti-immigrant. Its doors were shut. We wanted no refugees from Europe. It was already 1935, 36, 37, 38. 1939, our doors stayed shut. Germans were being hounded out of Germany. Italy had turned fascist. Europe was filled down with refugees. There were two refugee conferences, one in Avion in France, another one in Bermuda. The conclusion was no refugees allowed anywhere. So the world shut the doors on Europe. Casablanca, is, the opening of Casablanca is an interesting movie because it's all about refugees trying to find a place to go and not being able to make it. But, so this was the scene in 1938, really, 1938-39. FDR had just been elected second term. He was in the government. The country was really quite consumed still by its racial orientation. Uh, people of color were still being lynched daily almost in the South. Uh, the American, Native American was invisible. He was on, in, somewhere on the, uh, reservations. Uh, yellow people were limited in getting into the United States. Supreme Court had eight or nine cases to determine if a South Asian was white or not because the, some of the Pakistanis and Indians said, we're Aryans, we're not of any other race. We're the same race as the white race. Those cases went to the Supreme Court. The votes were nine, nothing, eight, one, that said, you're not white. They were dealing with subjects they had no idea what they were about, but the Supreme Court was always, always conservative, had never been anything but. So people look today and say, why can't we get back to the good old days of the Supreme Court? You really don't want that. Those good old days never existed. They existed for 13 years in the Warren Court. That was it, 1954 to 1967. That was the only time that liberals or people of that particular uh, ideology could say there was a court that they liked. Otherwise, Supreme Court put Japanese Americans in detention camps. They separated the races. They created every bad law known to man and validated it, and that's the way it was. But in August 1939, Franklin Delano Roosevelt got a letter in the mail, handed to him, not through the mail, but by a, a, uh, by a a man who was a friend of somebody else, and it was signed by Albert Einstein. It was written by three other refugees, Fermi and two Hungarians, Leo Zillard and Eugene Vigna, two other physicists. And they said, Dear Mr. President, you may not know this, but the Germans are working on a bomb that is very, very bad. And FDR read the letter, knew Einstein, and said, called in one of his close uh, uh, associates, a scientist he trusted from MIT, a man named Vannevar Bush, happened to graduate from Tufts, but he went to, uh, he did all this famous research at MIT, founded, uh, uh, what's it, one, I can't remember the name of the big company that he created right out here somewhere, but he called him in and he said, what do you think about this? He said, if Einstein, Wigner, Fermi, and Zillard signed this letter, you better take it seriously. And FDR never went to the Congress because he knew that Congress was shut the door, be nice to the Germans, because we were friend, very friendly with the Germans. We had diplomatic relations with, after all, Adolf Hitler in 1924, when he wrote Mein Kampf, had congratulatory statements about America. He said, the Americans have figured out the right way to deal with race. Can you imagine being congratulated in Mein Kampf? Uh, but he did, because America had figured it out because they had figured out eugenics. And that's what he said, you've done the right thing and you know what you're doing. FDR knew he didn't have a Congress that would back him. So he, gave, he, he told Bush, he said, go and take this and run with it. And Bush ran with it and within four years, FDR spent over $4 billion, created three cities in Hannaford, Washington, Los Alamos, New Mexico, and Oak Ridge, Tennessee, and got enough immigrant scientists together, a few American and a bunch of British scientists together, and we got 
the bomb. We got the bomb and we won the war. The Germans weren't going to get there, but the Germans had one superb physicist left, Werner Heisenberg, who won the Nobel Prize in 1926 uh, at the age of 26. So they were afraid Heisenberg could do it by himself, but they got off the wrong track and the Germans were not going to get the bomb. By already when we set off the device, uh, the test device in the desert, we knew that Germany was not going to get it. So the already there, the orientation was shifting away from Germany. The war was going to be lost by the Germans. The Germans were doing great physics, but it was not what Hitler called Jewish physics. Jewish physics meant who? Einstein and the rest of them who were doing nuclear fission. Lisa Meitner, uh, the few others who were doing work on, on nuclear fission, the creation of enormous explosive capacity through the uranium and then eventually plutonium bombs that were created. We got them, we did it, we dropped them. Uh, this particular phenomenon now of, the, of FDR accepting this, doing this with immigrant scientists. Hey, go, have you, any of you seen the movie Oppenheimer yet? You know, I mean, a lot of accents there at Los Alamos, a lot of Hungarians, a lot of Germans. They're all over the place. They got out. Turkey took a great many of them, but we finally let up enough to let a bunch of Germans into select schools. Chicago took a bunch. Columbia took a bunch. And we got enough physicists from Germany to really finally get the bomb, do the work that had to be done, and win the war in Europe. The other bunch of scientists from Germany went to the radiation laboratory at MIT. It, it, probably of equal, equal importance was the invention of radar. Radar won the war in the Atlantic, uh, but that was also European, German scientists, uh, British scientists, European scientists from everywhere, and it worked out. We won the war. Uh, 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 German science was ruined and dismissed completely. Uh, Congress knew nothing about what was going on. Harry Truman, who was hit, uh, FDR's vice president on his fourth term, didn't know anything about the bomb. So it, they, it was kept a secret from everybody. That was the first unbelievable accident. Adolf Hitler coming to power and getting enough, getting rid of his entire physics, mathematics programs, who eventually enough of them wound up in the United States for us to get the bomb and also to get a certain number of different kinds of names into the, European, into the American faculty at a small number of selective schools. A lot of them went up in the historically black schools. A lot of them went down black institutions. They also went to uh, uh, Black Mountain. They went to uh, Muskegee. They went to a whole bunch of other black schools and spent their whole lives down there. A few American schools brought them in and let them develop first-rate research opportunities. That was the first accident. The second accident was really freakish. 1944, well, both these accidents happened in a short, year, short period between 1933 and 1944. Ten year period, it all happened. Hitler destroyed the German system, we got enough to win the war. But in 1944, the American Legion, not your most liberal organization, the American Legion said, we do not want a repeat of what happened in World War I when 200,000 soldiers coming back could not get jobs because other people had taken their jobs. So we are going to come up with maybe a, something that can keep 200,000 veterans busy until a job opens up. Let's create a small opportunity for a couple hundred thousand to go to college. It was called the um, uh, uh, Servicemen's Reinvestment Act of 1944. We all know it as the GI Bill. Well, the American Legion wanted 200,000 and five million showed up. A million of them brought home war brides. And these were not typical American students. They were older guys, older women, different colors. Although the, war, the, the military, World War II, was fought segregated. Blacks and whites didn't fight together in the American army. Truman did that in 48. He integrated them in 48. But in the army, no, they were separate. I mean, Jackie Robinson, who was lieutenant in World War uh, II in Texas, got onto a bus, was told, go to the back of the bus by some sergeant. And Robinson said, I'm not going to the back of the bus. I'm sitting where I want. Sergeant brought up on charges, and Jackie Robinson was court-martialed. 
He was declared innocent, but told, get out of the army. You're a troublemaker. And Robinson quit the army, and the rest is uh, baseball history. But uh, the country was not ready for any change. In 44, this was done by the American Legion. In 45, 46, when the war ended, um, Levittown was built. It said in the protocols in Levittown, you cannot resell your property to a Negro. I mean, this is, America was not going to change. Business as usual. Rosie the Riveter was going to come home, go back into the kitchen, and start cooking uh, instant uh, dinners. Uh, that was going to be the great invention. But the five million who came back and went to college flooded the American campuses. The campuses that had tiny numbers of people suddenly found themselves overwhelmed. Over half the money coming into Harvard was from GIs. Over two-thirds the money coming into Tufts was from GIs. So the GI brought money and the colleges got addicted to that money. They needed that money, they had hard times, nobody was going to college during the war, ROTC kept them alive, and so the second most important, if not the most important, event that took place by accident was the GI Bill. Uh, that is an astonishing story of these guys coming home with their war brides, tough veterans, and then there was a little secondary part of it in that a, a segregationist senator from Arkansas had an idea in 46, said, why don't we take all this war material left over from, from the war and give it to these other nations, but sell it and let them use their currency to pay us back, and then we'll send kids over for a year of study. They must have a bachelor's degree, and that gave more incentive to get a bachelor's degree. And that was Senator William Fulbright. Senator William Fulbright created the Fulbright Act, and hundreds of thousands of American kids with a bachelor's degree start applying to get German marks, Polish Zloty, French francs, Italian lira, anything they could get, and they got a free year in Europe. And so it was an astonishing time for American higher education. And am I saying to myself, is this the golden year? I'm not sure. But 45, 46, America was not ready for the golden age. America, the same faculty. When I arrived at Tufts in 1964, they were still teaching courses about the frontier, the conquest of the frontier. It was still all American Indians looked like Anthony Quinn. Uh, it was still Errol Flynn in Custer's Last Stand. It was still the glorification of uh, Frederick March playing Christopher Columbus. Hollywood glorified that narrative of American history, the narrative we were all brought up on unless you went to a little red diaper school somewhere in Brooklyn or somewhere, we all were brought up on the congratulatory narrative of American history, that America was destined to be the country that it was. It was a comfortable, comfortable narrative. We all liked it very much, uh, and we bought into it. The new faculty coming back, these new people whose names ended in vowels and witzes and bergs and things like that, they became the first generation of new faculty. As the old faculty died off, the new faculty came in. Armenians, Greeks, Italians, Irish, Catholics, Jews, everything. And the new faculty was born from the 1940s on. That probably was the single most transformative event that took place in American higher education. The new faculty. As the old, totally harmonious, totally uh, in, uh, um, uh, sympathetic, and of one-dimensional faculty that all agreed and all smiled at one another, died off, what did we get? Diversity. And what will diversity give you? Contentiousness. You cannot have civility and diversity. It won't happen. If you bring in different people together, you're going to have fights. And American <coughs> University started having fights. They wanted John Belushi in the Animal House. Instead, they got Alan Bloom and the closing of the American mind. And that has been the struggle for the last 60 years. The struggle for who owns the American narrative? Who gets to tell the story of American history? That battle is going on. And I ask myself, you know, of all these 400 years, was there a golden age? And as I look at myself and I look at Mr. Salter sitting right here in front of me, the two of us had it all. And so I say, yes, there was a golden age. 
there may even still be a golden age. It may be a little tarnished and we are getting dumped on like nobody's business. But the rest of the world knows that there is no Brigham Young in Russia. There is no Notre Dame in China. There is nothing out there but state controlled bureaucracies. What we have is an anarchy with self-inflicted wounds, and we do. We stab ourselves, we kill ourselves, we butcher ourselves, but at the end of the day, there is nothing like the 6,000 institutions of higher learning in this country, and the students that come to take risk. They come and major in undecided. They don't know what they're gonna do, and they spend four years as immature adolescents growing up, and all of us have gone through that experience. So my mind still says we may do it in a most uneconomical, dumbest way known to man, but no country in the world does it this way, and nobody yet has pushed us off the top of the mountain. We always want to be pushed off. When Sputnik went up in 57, Hyman Rickover, who was running the, uh, the Navy uh, atomic energy program for submarines, said everybody has to learn Russian. The Russians know how to educate. We don't. Well, the Russians are gone. Then came the common, common market. They were all putting together the European Union is going to take our, uh, our lunch away from us. Japan knows how to do it. Now it's what country? China. They spent $19 billion to create a university system. And yet the Chinese themselves know a system based on hierarchy, fraud, and a lack of freedom. And that's the one thing that Americans have. We're ungovernable. We have incompetent administrations, ungovernable faculty, and we are the envy of the world. Thank you. <laughs> Question. Anything. Okay. I'm ready. I made a mess. Yes, sir. Let's assume for the moment the brilliance of our family plans and the brilliance of the Constitution and the Yeah. Jefferson did not want a faith-based school, so he created in his home state a university, the University of Virginia. The faculty had to sleep with loaded pistols under their pillows. The kids were so riot, they were children. They were ages between 13 and 17, and they were all Southerners. They were dueling, they were drinking, they were, they were doing everything they could. Jefferson was horrified at the University of Virginia in his first 10 years, but we couldn't find this. The rest of them, Madison went to, I believe, Virginia. Another one might have gone to Princeton. The vast majority of the founding fathers had no education or were self-taught at home. They were mostly also deists in that they didn't, they believed in Spiritual. spirituality. Some believed in the divinity of Christ. Jefferson didn't. If you go and look at the Jefferson Bible, every miracle, it's, it's at the Smithsonian, is cut out. He cut out every miracle and left a book with holes in it. That's the Jefferson Bible. Uh, somebody did a good eye on television program. What created the You know, they were determined that they were going to have. Uh, well, you know, it all depends who's writing the history. You're asking me. I'm not an American historian. I, all I do is without a license. I'm not trained as a historian. But if you read enough history books, you see there's a debate there too. The largest landowners in the United States in 1790 were Washington and Madison and Jefferson. They owned huge amounts of land in their own state and on the other side of the Appalachian. They were wealthy, wealthy, wealthy men. And they wanted to keep that wealth. They were not freeing the slaves in any great dimension. And they made their, their fortunes uh, through a variety of different ways. The rest of them were the same. You know, the founding fathers, the first five out of the first six were all slave owners. So what got them to, and, and the Constitution itself is a reasonably flawed document. It does talk about, you know, we the people and all of that, the Declaration of Independence. But when you get down to it, it was a justification for slavery. And that, get, well, it was, it's it, the two-fifths rule that said, you know, a slave counts for two-fifths of a vote. It was most important was for the states to keep their independence. And that had to be balanced out. So the reality of what those meetings were in Philadelphia and New York 
Man, it was warfare. To create a country that was free of England. That's all they cared about. Break, get free of England and stay away. So, I mean, if you read Gordon Wood, you read the great historians of today, you got it, you're living in a privileged time because American historians, uh, David McCullough, uh, uh, Doris Kearns Goodwin, independent ones, ones affiliated with universities like Jill Lepore, they had dynamite, the greatest time in the world to be a reader of American history is now. Anything else? You want to disagree, argue, or fight? <laughs> It all depends what you meant by education. I mean, there were so many in the schools in the United States. For instance, Rockefeller and Vanderbilt did attend academies, business academies. They learned shorthand, uh, you know, trying to learn a little bit about the law so they can figure out how to screw the guy next door. But that's how basically, you know, we were not, uh, and if anything, the law of passing down to the children had a bigger effect on the Catholic Church because it brought finally Priests couldn't marry after the ninth century because they didn't like the idea of their children inheriting. But, uh, you know, Adams produced um, uh, another president after him, and then they eventually produced Groucho Marx, President Quincy Adams had for eggs there. <laughs> yes? I want to thank you for a wonderful lecture. Really fascinating and informative. But it occurred to me that there are many places in uh, I couldn't what? You couldn't give that lecture. It would not be well received. Uh, and you might not even, uh, you know. You know, uh, what's her name? Uh, who is the Cheney who is? Yeah, the uh, woman. The woman who is. The situation going to change. Yeah, the woman who is the Cheney who ran the National Endowment for the Humanities. Was it Lynn or the, the, the daughter became Liz? I think that was Lynn Cheney. She said something very wise at the NEH. She said, "You tamper with American narrative." You tamper with our historical narrative, and you're asking for trouble. She was right. Uh, there might be places I get thrown out. Yeah, by all means. But all I'm talking about is something that I learned in graduate school. Look for the evidence. All I care about is evidence. And the evidence is um, Christopher Columbus was not a nice guy. <laughs> you know, I mean, and then neither was Lord Jeff. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, Lord F. Uh, Jeffrey Amherst. He was not. A, he actually did give smallpox to the Indians. But I wouldn't have taken his name up because I don't think I'm, I personally don't take monuments down. You know that's our history. You can't change your history. You can ignore it. You can try to put it under a rug, but you can't change it. So I might get thrown out in some places. I think I'm safe in Winchester. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Gene. I'm not changing your grade. Wonderful lecture. Where do you see the next decade going? I have no idea. I certainly am not prescient. I have no idea. All I know is the country that is going to push us off the top of the higher education mountain has not yet been identified. We still, the rest of the world wants what we have. Americans dump all over it. But the rest of the world says, you got something that we want. So all those colleges, thousands, we've got 5,000 degree-granting institutions in this country. 100, 500 are Bible schools, 50 or 60 feet, but we got, they're, they're certified. So you get a degree in Bible education from some dinky little school or some enormous Bible school with 15, 20,000 students. We've got them too. Yes, there was another hand back there, I think I saw. So I think, you know, the prognosis is good, but we're in a period where the faculty are going to be not liked and respected. That's it. We got it. So we're getting out just at the right time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I am the luckiest man in the world. Ron and I, we, we were there at the golden age, and I do believe that golden age is, it's, it may not be silver, and it's tarnished, and all of that, but it's still, we're still the envy of the world. Yeah, Jean? I just say one thing, everybody, I was his student. <laughs> so I know how fantastic <laughs> he was in those years, and he galvanized us all these other years, and I come back to listen to him. <laughs> and it's the same Dr. Gilman. I, yeah. I 
but see, in a way, in a way, it's, this is very important, very emblematic. Gene Hambright was the only doctoral student I ever had. I, was, I went to Tufts to teach undergraduates, but Tufts changed under my feet. It wanted to get involved in the prestige of being a PhD granting institution. American University colleges got hung up on prestige. Just a couple of years before I arrived at Tufts, it changed its name from Tufts College to Tufts University. We didn't have, our library was smaller than Bates. It was a joke, but we wanted to be called a university. We weren't there, but we were called. So when I was evolving uh, into whatever I evolved into, Jeannie comes along and said, well, you know, I better direct, direct at least one dissertation in my life. So I had her, she got a dissertation, she got a job, she got tenure, she retired, and I'm successful. That's it. <laughs> I was one and done. Which is, by the way, what the name is for the disgraceful basketball program at Duke. At Duke University, one of the great universities in the country, they would take freshman basketball players in who started on the varsity team. Five of them started on the varsity team. And they were put in, played first semester, didn't ever went to class. Then uh, they were put on suspension, but the NCA changed the law that said you could play when you're suspended. So they finished the year. Duke went on to the NCAA. These guys got thrown out of school and signed with the NBA for $10 million. American higher education stabs itself everywhere. We're like the St. Christopher of America. We inflict wounds on ourselves, and big time athletics is right now the biggest wound we've got. It is gambling. Kids are going broke. You can gamble on television. You can gamble anywhere. It is a disgrace, and we're into it like big time. We're going to, Tufts, at Tufts, if you have a pulse and you can breathe on a mirror, you can get onto a, get a uniform. I went to one of those schools, a tiny little Methodist school in New Jersey. Uh, the school that I went, Drew University, named after Daniel Drew, one of the really big crooks of the Golden Age. He invented uh, watered stock. Daniel Drew would buy cows in Texas, drive them up to Chicago, and just before he sold them, he pumped them full of water got them heavy, and sold them, and invented watered stock, then founded a Methodist seminary. <laughs> and then a little liberal arts college that I attended, and it changed my life, you know? They don't have a category in the rankings of schools that how many, changed, how many lives were changed by going. When I went to Drew, it accepted 90% of the applicants. Now it's still accepting 90% of the applicants. <laughs> the number of schools that take almost, and there are two dozen schools that take 20% or less of the applicants. There are probably another 200 that accept 50% or less. The other 5,000 plus take anybody, and they're great. They're wonderful places to go to school. That's what's unique about this country. You'll find somebody at some dinky little school who will change your life. Probably happened to a bunch of you. Okay? Now, hold that perfect.